their hints, tips, favorite books, favorite photographers, things like that, so that others can see what everybody else likes. And maybe you'll find some new either books or techniques or something like that. And each swig, it'll be a different member. And Margie's the coordinator. So get in touch with Margie if you have something that you want to, to show everybody. And so for mine, I will give you guys a choice. I can either show you three books that I recommend highly, or I can give you a tour of the dark room because it's all of 10 feet away. We can't have both. That's what I was going to say. You could get both, actually. The books are right here, too. <laughs> okay. Dark room. Dark room. Dark room. Dark room sounds good. All right, we'll see if this works because I'm, I'm on the laptop, so. Okay. Is that where you wash your prints? Um, that's the sink where all of the, where everything, oh, you mean the, yes, this, this is a multi-use room. And yes, there have been times that I have been doing laundry and doing darkroom stuff at the same time, which is why there's black plastic that I hang over the lights on them. Have you ever done any platinum plating? No, I have not tried platinum. I've done cyanotypes. I've done gum bichromate, which is kind of, it's similar in process, but I have not done platinum. Yeah. Um, and larger one that does 35 millimeter and 120, which I've had for close to 20 years now, I think. And this is the one that does four by five. And I can print 16 by 20 with it kind of easily, more easily than I can with my sink, however. And I managed to find a big stainless steel sink on Craigslist. My next door neighbor can do plumbing. So he actually installed this. And that's pretty much it. I even, I developed two batches of film today. Um, some 35 millimeter and 120. But they're hanging to dry in a shower upstairs so that they don't get all dusty. Because that's the biggest problem with a dark room that doubles as the laundry room. Well, I'm really good at spotting prints. So I know nothing of a dark room or the dark room equipment, and mm -hmm. I have a vague understanding of what takes place in it. But okay. could you kind of go through a pretend process there? Like sort step of. By step? Let's see if I can put. Yeah, uh, we have a dark room at the art center. Maybe you would like to teach a class in the spring. I'd love to. I could. We're we're equipped. We have enlargers. We have you know a sink, and it's uh, uh, we have um, some extra paper that uh, was donated to us for developing. And I, if you come over one day, I can show you what we have, and maybe you could write up a proposal for a spring class. Sure. Yeah. That would be wonderful. Yeah, I could definitely teach a, a darkroom class. So that I taught criminal wonderful. justice majors how to develop films, so I can. Great. So we would love to have you. OK. Well, Charlia, just to follow up on that, and that the class for Beth is a great idea. When Brian and I visited the Arts Center a year or so ago, um, we had talked to um, Rose. So, yeah. And, and she, yeah, she had given us a tour of, uh, and included the dark room. And we had talked about the possibility maybe of someday us having one of our club meetings there. So that either someone working for you, or maybe in this case, Beth, could actually give us a demonstration. 
that would be wonderful. We could, we could set something up. I'm part of the education committee. So you could contact me when you're ready or when you want, might want to do that. And I could set up some things with uh, times. Okay, that'd be great. Okay, yeah. So the basic gist is this is a, a negative carrier and there's different ones for like each different type of enlarger has their own outer size. And then there's a different sized hole depending on what size negative you're doing. So this is one for 35 millimeter. You open it up, you put it in, you make sure the frame you want is right there. This goes in here. Yeah, this one's not hooked up. It's the other one that's hooked up, of course. But light up here shines down through, shines on the, the board. You can move the whole thing up and down to get it to the size you want. And then use this to focus. It's got an aperture in the here to change it for whether it's, if it's a bulletproof negative, you're gonna want it lots of light going through. Mine are not usually bulletproof. Um, and then once you figure out how to, what time you wanna expose the paper for, then you would take it over and it would go in developer and then stop bath and then fixer and then in a water bath. And I don't have the trays out to, to show you those, but because I was doing film today. Well, right. What do you mean by bulletproof? If you overexpose your, your negatives or if you vastly overdevelop them, mm -hmm. you'll end up with a really, really thick negative. And um, hold up. See. Uh, remember which box they're in. Just say that overexposing is kind of rare for me. I am much. Uh, I don't know where they are, but a, a normal one looks like. This. I don't know if you can even see. You can sort of see the images through it. Uh -huh. If it's bulletproof, it's just black. And then you need to hit it with a ton of light to be able to get anything on the, the photo paper. Hmm. And all of that is done with, I don't know how well the computer is going to react to this. Yeah. In this amount of light. Okay. <laughs> so how long does that process take just to do one print then? <laughs> um, if it's the first print of something that I haven't printed before, it's probably 15, 20 minutes. But once I know what settings I need to use, then I can bang them out like the five to 10 tops. Because it's with fiber paper, which is the good stuff, it needs to be in the developer for two minutes, the stop bath for about 30 seconds, and then the fixer for about a minute. And usual exposure times under the enlarger are eh, around 20 seconds ish, oh. if I don't have to do any extra burning in. Beth, uh, how, how critical are the times in those baths? Do you have a exactly two minutes, five or 10 seconds either way, or how does that work? It, I try really hard to, to nail the timing. I use a little LCD kitchen timer. And it, five seconds isn't gonna matter that much, but 30 seconds would. Okay. And I try to be extra methodical with that so that if something is messed up, I know that it's not that. And I can go to, to wherever else in the process. I might have messed I, up. I imagine you're quite precise based on your background as a forensic chemist, so. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there, there's a fair amount of methodicalness. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, how, how about you, you do color and black and white, correct? No, just black and white. Black and white, okay. I've never tried doing color. Um, with that, you have to be in pitch black. That's not a, a red light thing. That's a no light thing. Oh, really? I didn't know yeah. that. Well, because otherwise you'd have extra red on all of your prints. Isn't there a problem with the chemicals? I remember when I, I developed black and white pictures for my thesis ages ago, and I remember the color required a lot of temperature control of the chemicals, which was problematic yeah. storing and stuff. That's why we never got into it. But. Yeah, it's, it's a lot more critical to get the temperature right with color. With black and white, you can adjust for temperature. I mean, 68 is the, the norm, but if you're doing something at less than 68, you give it more time. If it's over 68, you give it less time. How many years have you been developing? I first learned in high school. Okay. Um, and then I did it off and on until probably, oh, well, even in about 99, I was taking darkroom classes. I was living in Mass at the time, and the Danforth Museum had a dark room and did classes. So I took classes there. And then in about 03 or 04 up there, I had my own dark room at home. So I did that and I moved here in 07. And I think this space was up and running in like two months. Thanks to my best next door neighbor ever. <laughs> Because he did the wiring, too, for the enlargers. So they're even on their own circuit. In fact, I think they're even on their own box. Where do you buy your chemicals from B&H? Or... No, freestyle photo. And are they reasonable? Yeah. Their prices are a, a teensy bit more than B&H for stuff, but they'll ship. B&H won't ship chemicals anymore. Okay. Mm -hmm but Freestyle will ship chemicals. And they don't last too long, do they? Um, some do, some don't. If something is a powder and it's not mixed up, that'll last for a while. Um, liquids start to go once the top's been opened. Okay. But some of them last for maybe five, six months. Some of them, I wouldn't give it much more than a few weeks. Mm. The stuff that well, I use, um, I have a pretty good idea of how long I can get away with leaving something open. Um, like stop bath will last for a long time, but and fixer will last decently. But developer anything over about four months is kind of suspect. What 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 types of chemicals are they? Are they alcohols. Esters, what are they in general? Do you? Um, you know what? I should know, but I haven't really <laughs> looked at all the formulas. Um, if you want to look them up, the developer that I use, I use everything from Ilford. So ilfordphoto.com okay. has at least some information because they've got all the MSDS stuff on their site. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank uh, you. The fix, fixer that I use is an ammonium-based one, so it doesn't stink as bad as some of the old ones. Mm -hmm. It's also faster. Um, Do you have to store your chemicals at a certain uh, temperature? Yeah, room temp is fine. In fact, they're all <laughs> sitting right under the sink. I have some at the art center that probably should be demol thrown out. So it's probably not a good idea to just toss them. So where do you, it's, I don't want to mess up the environment. So what do you do with those old chemicals? I, well, some people are able to get rid of stuff at community um, hazardous waste days if they do those. Um, I haven't seen that many of those around here. I have a contract with Safety Clean. Okay. So I have this big blue bin bucket thing. 
and all of my used up chemicals go in that. Okay. It's not cheap to get rid of stuff. So no, no and the chemicals aren't cheap either. <laughs> Uh, the chemicals are cheaper than getting rid of them, I think. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's not encouraging. <laughs> okay. I appreciate you sharing that, Beth. You know sure. what you're doing. You know what you're doing. I've developed a few little things but uh, with help, but I'm definitely not an expert or even a developer. <laughs> <laughs> can, can can I, I, can, can, is my least favorite thing, but... Hmm? I wanted to ask one last question, if it's okay, Beth? Yeah. yeah. We, we talk about, oh, we do, you know, Lightroom and, and, um, and Photoshop, we talk about dodging and burning because it simulates what you can do in a, in a dark room. How do you dodge and burn in, in, in a dark room? While the... Let's see, where is my... Tool. While the, the light is coming down through the enlarger and the paper's on the stage, you can block using something like this, which is a coat hanger with cardboard and gaffer tape, and you can dodge this to block the light from getting to certain spots if you want those areas to be lighter. And I don't know where my... I have all sorts of things for burning so that you can, like this, you can block areas and then let the light go just to certain spots. Somewhere around here, I have a card that's just got a, a small hole. So if you only put light to one spot that you want darker, that's burning and that's how you do that. That's, so what do you do? You, you let the light expose there, and then you expose the whole picture, and then you put that in to, to, to burn a certain spot? Yeah. Like... So, so, so you, you, you can custom cut one, depending on the picture, if you had something you really were working on that was... Yep. Critical. Like... <laughs> okay. <laughs> I did this. I have a picture of Stonehenge that... The sky is really cool and you can see the sky in the negative, but the rocks just get really, really dark and practically invisibly dark as far as detail if you try to expose the whole print for the God sky. Yeah. So I made that by, I sh shone the light down on a piece of mat board and drew an outline of where the stones were so that I can use that as a tool. Wow. Mm. That was very, very helpful. I was, I was wondering how that correlated to a dark room because it's supposed to be a dark room but not being a dark room person, I had no clue. Yeah. <laughs> the one tool that you've got in Photoshop that I wish I had in here is the heal tool. <laughs> heal and clone both. Beth, I saw that My you friend. had some, uh, <laughs> Beth, I saw that you had a purifier or a filter in your water line. How is yep. that important? How important is that in the process uh, that you're doing? It's extremely important here because we have a well. Mm. What, what does it filter? And we have, hmm? What does it filter? Uh, crud, basically. Particulates? It's, um, just particulates. No. Oh. Because this area is definitely in the rust belt. And if I, I mean, we've got a softener, we've got two tanks that take out the iron and there's still stuff that comes out if I don't have that on there. Hmm. It's better than it used to be, but it's, yeah. <laughs> if, if not for all of that stuff on it, what comes out straight from the well is red hmm. and a little on the sludgy side. Mm -hmm. Would you have to do that if you have city water, Beth? Probably not. Okay. I would still use this because this is, mixes the temperature. Hmm. So once I get the, like, if you can see up here, there's the, it shows me what the temperature is that's going through. And I can change 
using these, I can change the hot and the cold amounts so that what comes out the hose is exactly the temperature that I want. Do you so, vary that temperature at all? I mean, is there a domain constant? It remains constant as long as nobody in the rest of the house flushes a toilet. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> or uses a bunch of water. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Set the toilet fan on when you're in the uh, when you're in the dark room. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, I'm not always running the water that much. That'll be like if I'm if I'm washing prints or something, then it it kind of needs to stay within a few degrees. When you're washing film is when it needs to stay within about a degree at most. Because otherwise you can end up with something called reticulation. Although every time I've tried to do that, I don't get it. So. Beth, did you, do you wash your prints at 68 degrees? I always just wash my prints in cold water when I did it. I didn't I, think like that. I wash them in whatever temperature is coming out of it. Okay. It tends to be about 68. Um, it depends on time of year, how, like, what it normally is just coming out. Okay. So, suppose, I've heard that if you wash them in colder water, you get warmer looking prints on fiber. And if you wash in warmer water, you get colder looking prints and that's with neutral tone paper. But I don't know if that's just internet myth. Uh, I was usually using uh, RC paper anyhow, so. Yeah, I, yeah, RC can take just about anything. Yeah. And like a five minute wash is fine too. Fiber, it's more like an hour. Yeah, yeah, fiber so I, all the time. Yeah. So for fiber, I actually have this slot thing that's, so they each get their own spot. And when it's full of water, it weighs a ton. How do you dry your fiber prints? I have screens that are, they, uh, I think they're from Calumet. But I don't have a holder. So actually, this is where doing it in the laundry room helps because they fit nicely on my drying yeah, rack. On the drying rack. <laughs> so I put the screens across the drying rack and put the fiber prints on that. Okay. I was wondering, because I the, the few fiber prints that I did, I had issues with uh, the, the edges crawling up. Oh yeah, edges always curl. Where That's... and then I had I had come across a one of the actual dryers that you put the fiber print in and then close it. Oh, like that a made all the difference in the world. And of course, you could dry the print in about uh, twenty minutes to a half an hour with that way. Oh yeah, I don't like to dry mine that way, but I do have a a dry mount press. Okay. It doubles as a a holder for whatever else I'm playing with, but. You can also just, once they're dry, put them in a, a coffee table book and put other stuff on top. Okay. But yeah, fi bit. fiber curls. Yeah. That was always the issue I had with fiber. I hated that. <laughs> yeah. Some of Ilford's new stuff doesn't curl as badly as the old stuff did. They, they've actually put research into that. Cool. So, so there are most of you, uh, do you use Premier Imaging for your digital work or not? I send stuff to MPEX online. I like MPEX for their metal. Hmm? Um, I haven't yeah. tried that. I've, I've done one metallic print and that's about it. And it, but it's not a, a sheet of metal. Okay. Aluminum, I, I believe they use. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I but yeah. I do like young. Yes. 
Mpix will do them on a sheet of a metal or a sheet of aluminum if you mm -hmm. want them to. Yeah. Um, Bay Photo does and a few other. Actually, a lot of places do them on metal now. It used to be just Bay Photo. It was the only place you could get them, but a lot of places have added metal printing uh, to their group of stuff that they do. Mm. Michaels does them. <laughs> They do a 16 by 20 for like $70, $75. I'm going to start charging 25 cents every time Annie plugs Michaels. <laughs> 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 well, you were talking about metal prints. So I'm just saying, you know, I didn't realize till I started working there that they did that. Do they do sponsorships of groups? I wish. <laughs> Trust me, I sponsor us all the time. <laughs> Well, thank you, Beth. Appreciate that. That was a great uh, sure. little show and tell. Yeah, that was interesting, Beth. Very thank good. You, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It, it almost, it almost briefly makes me want to do that again. <laughs> <laughs> That's fun. Oh, I know it's fun. I loved it. Other than developing film. I hate developing film. Yeah, me too. That's that's, that's the most, worst part of the entire process. Yeah, that's almost like watching paint dry. <laughs> yeah. Well, and also knowing that if you mess something up in that, you can't fix it. Right. If you mess up a print, you yeah, you're going to start over again. Yep. So Margie was on for a short while and then got off. But yeah. Uh, so Beth yeah. introduced this concept for us in addition to putting on the first presentation. But just a reminder, um, so this is a good example, and it doesn't have to be darkroom work because probably most of you don't do darkroom, but any little thing that you do that might be of interest to the rest of us, contact Margie and tell her what you like to do, and we'll set you up for some future SWIG meeting to do a little show and tell, if you will. It can be camera techniques, equipment that you might use, um, videos that you refer to, Beth mentioned books before, um, post-processing techniques that you might find useful, anything that you think might be of interest to the rest of us. Just contact Margie, let her know you'd like to sign up for a 10, 15, 20 minute presentation. It can be a five minute presentation, but just something to provide information for the rest of us, just to share, kind of a show and tell. All right, um, so before we're going to do the, some of us submitted uh, three photos, juried photos. Um, we'll review those first, and then I'll get into the presentation on Luminar. Uh, but before we do the juried photos, just a couple of reminders. We heard this before. Uh, the photo contest, monthly photo contest, ends Monday, November the 30th, so get your entries in. We had a, boy, did we have a lot of entries last month. Hopefully we can get just as many this month. Um, the Hannistown tree portfolio submittals need to be finished or completed by Monday, the end of the month as well, November 30th. And uh, Annie would probably mention this as well. The other thing that's going on Monday, the 30th, is the pickup of your photos from Feathers and Irwin from the show. Um, so, Brian, do you have any other things that people need to know about Clubwise? Uh, not that I'm not that I know of. Uh, how was the trip to the zoo? How many people went? Kind of, I didn't get to go to that since so I had a migraine in the morning when I woke up, so I didn't go. But uh, if you could give us just a quick little two-second recap of that, that'd be appreciated. Uh, it was just the four of us. Um, it was uh, DL, Annie, Melissa, and myself. But I think we all had a great time. The zoo um, was not very crowded that day. Uh, the weather was overcast and the temperature was mild. The animals were out and active and I swear 75% of them were posing for the camera. <laughs> uh, it was from a photographic standpoint it was a great day i think and mm -hmm. you want to throw in anything 
Yeah, I think we uh, we got a big kick out of the the cheetahs. They had uh, they have actually five young cheetahs plus mama, so there were six cheetahs and they were hilarious. I mean, they were chasing each other. They had a ball. They were playing with it. The um, I don't know. We were really getting some great pictures out of the big cats. D L got himself a new girlfriend on the one kid on the one cat. <laughs> Right, DL? He's not going to say anything. You say so. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> it was it was following DL around. Like he would he would walk up around the side of the side of the uh, enclosure, and that cat would follow him up the side of the enclosure. It was pretty funny. But we asked DL a couple times to do that so we could get some good shots of the cat when it came back down. <laughs> <laughs> So, but yeah, we we really had a had a nice time. The uh, the animals were definitely uh, seemed to want to pose for us. Uh, the one giraffe, he kept following us around and um, kept uh, giving us uh, good shots of portrait shots of him. And so, and then they have a couple newer areas that they're working on in there. So. Yeah, it was a night. All in all, it was a nice day. It was a nice day to photograph the animals. The uh, y'all gorillas were also giving us quite a show. They have a baby in there, and uh, he was acting like a um, terrible two. <laughs> he was climbing all over the windows, like right up on us. I uh, had another one that was. Uh, probably still a juvenile. He climbed up on the window and was knocking on the window at me. He knocked, did that a couple of times. He sat there for, I don't know, for a while. But um, yeah, it was, we, we really had a good, a good time. It was a lot of fun. So anybody didn't go, you missed it. <laughs> hmm. All right, well, let's go uh, to Reddit. And let's, let me share my screen. And Brian, just for future reference here, before I go any further, because I'm going to be sharing different screens on my computer. Uh -huh. um, is there a way to just like be able to show anything that I put up on my screen? Uh, are you using more than one screen, Jim? Well, one monitor, if you will, but different windows. Okay, so instead of, you want to share the whole monitor instead of just a particular yes. program? So yeah. you're going to share the screen itself. Oh, that is one of the options, screen. Yes. Okay. So share the All screen, right. then anything that you put on that screen will show up at that point. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. We'll do that. Okay, so right now you should just see my Zoom screen, I guess. Do you see my Reddit screen? Yep. All right, good. So we'll just go down these in order. And um, so Dennis, you'll be first. And what I, there's, I think there's four of us. Um, Dennis, Beth, um, Candy, Annie, and myself submitted photos for this purpose. Uh, and it's th only three photos each. What I thought is we could go through them one by one. And um, then it's just tell us a little bit about the photo, either what the circumstances were you took it or anything unusual about it, or just, just a few words about each photo, just to enlighten us, if you will. Pretty. And that photo was at Cape May, New Jersey. Uh, we were down in the springtime and it had stormed. So in the morning, I packed my tripod and camera across the boardwalk, <clears throat> set up, and I had this, it's a, at times these are drains. They put pipes on them and they pump the sand from one side to the other, uh, but not now. And I think I did a 30 second exposure I uh, intentionally oriented the pilings the way they are from left to right. Um, 
and it, uh, you know, there's enough turbulence in the water, you get this misty uh, look. And I thought it turned out pretty well. And it, it's been submitted in competitions and did pretty well. Any questions? No, it's beautiful. Yep. Oh, I love that picture, it's beautiful. Looks like it would be a winner. Yeah. I like how it leads the eye into the picture. Yeah, yeah. A little work on the pilings to bring out the detail. Okay, we'll go to the next one. This is my favorite, Dennis. Yeah, I call it Potter of Small Pots. Uh, this is at a, uh, a country fair in Connecticut, Goshen, uh, and this woman makes little pots and sells them on site. And she allowed me to take uh, photos of her hands. Um, and you know, I think that what in my mind makes it is the orientation of the fingers. Mm -hmm. uh, only one finger touches, uh, and the other two are you know sort of anticipating what to do next. Uh, you can see a little bit of her, her glasses, so you know there's a person attached to it. Uh, and there, there's uh, the, the, the turntable's turning, uh, so it's kind of blurred. Uh, and I was pretty pleased with it. Uh, there's, a, there's a bit of work in controlling the, the specular reflections off the wet clay. So I spent some time in Photoshop cloning the reflections out because they were distracting. Um, and I, I, in my, I thought it was a great idea, but I made three or four prints, uh, different views of it, and I sent it to the woman. And a year later, I asked her if she liked the photos, and she said, no, you made my hands look old. <laughs> <laughs> but it's another one that's, that's judged pretty well. There's so much feeling in that, so much emotion in, yeah. in that simple Intense. Intense. Yeah. yeah. It really tells a story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dennis, what was the settings on the camera, if you remember? Uh, well, I'd have to look. Okay. The, the, the wheel is blurred. Was that intentional? Well, the wheel's moving. No, right, but it looks like a... Uh, okay. It just looks a little blurred. It's, moving, it's moving fast enough that it, it blurs in the shutter speed that I have. Okay. Um, I'll have a look and I'll tell you next time we talk. Okay. Nice shot. Very nice. Thank you. The old hands add character to the uh, project. Really? What I said to her. Yeah, it really enhances it. Might be interesting to do a, a before and after of this. Mm. Very nice. Very nice. This is, uh, it's taken in Danbury, Connecticut. Danbury, some of you may know, at one time had a famous uh, fair at the, at, called the Danbury Fair for years. And they would have rides and they do some car races and uh, that ended before we got there in 82. But occasionally they would have a fair downtown. And this is downtown Danbury. Uh, obviously it's a swing ride. The, the, the center, it's facing west into the mid-afternoon sun. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, I must have, I, I took quite a few of these because it's kind of poke and hope, it's moving. And the, to be frank, the photo is reversed left to right because I like the riders go from two to three to two to one, and then the swings go from three to two to one. Uh, and I call it, what did I call it? Uh, well, I had some clever phrase for what I call that. Uh, but I like the fact that they sort of appear and disappear. And uh, it's another photo that's done well in judging. And it's one of the few photos I've actually sold. I sold two copies of that. We had a show in the Danbury Fair Mall, which replaced it, was built on the Danbury Fair Fairgrounds. Uh, and the Housatonic Valley Arts Council had a, 
uh, they would put up uh, um, display boards in the mall and put artwork on them. Uh, sometimes three dimensional, sometimes two dimensional. And this one I sold two copies of that. What shutter speed was that shot at? You know, that's probably modestly quick. It was bright. Uh, because there's not there's there's bending and a little bit of movement in some of the hair, but not a lot. Uh, but I, I have to look that up. I don't I don't recall. And there's not a lot of editing done on it. Um, there were a couple flags. You know how these these uh, triangular flags around these rides, and I took those out to make it cleaner. I'm pretty pleased with this. Well, some of it is pure dumb luck. I like the light. Hmm. the light. I like the perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Did you get on the ride? No. <laughs> <laughs> the clouds had a nice essence to yeah. it. They're reaching for the clouds. Yeah. Thank mm -hmm. you. It works well black and white. Hmm. Yeah, it well does. Balanced. Very nice, Dennis. Very nice. Thank you. Thanks, Dennis. Very Beautiful nice. shot. Get you too far away here. <clears throat> okay, Beth, you're up. This was shot in Garnet, Montana, which is a Bureau of Land Management run uh, ghost town. It's not, I haven't been to Bodie, but pictures I've seen at Bodie are better than what you can find at Garnet. But Garnet basically looks like everybody just got up one day and left. Is this a workshop? Hmm? Is this a Tillman Crane workshop? No, this was, I was up there for a workshop at the Rocky Mountain School of Photography yeah. in Missoula, yeah. which was with David Wells. And we all went up there, somebody had found out about the place and we all went up there together on one of our free afternoons, but David didn't even go. He'd, he'd been there before. So it was, this was just, most of the class deciding to take off on our own. And the main rule was you're not allowed to move things. So this was basically <laughs> how it looked when I got there. Yeah. And so that's, and that was the shot that I got of that. This was the first image that I ever submitted to a, an attempt at getting into a gallery show and it got in. I like the angle of the boots leading you back to the chair and the light on the chair. I, I yeah. really like what you That's did like. there. It's, it's a very nice mm. narrative. Mm -hmm. nice. I have a couple other slightly different angles and this was the one that just jumped out like, yep, this is the one. Beth, is this a pure black and white, or is there like a, a tone, a coloration here, like a sepia? It's black and white, but it's printed on warm tone paper. Oh, okay. And I think when I scanned it, it's got a little bit more of the warm tone than the actual print. Hmm. But it's a darkroom one. Nice. Image. Shot on film. Hmm. Very nice. Very nice. You think somebody before you planted those shoes there? It's possible. Yeah. I've seen other shots of the the same boots and chair, and the boots have definitely been moved around. Yeah, no times. doubt. So no doubt. Not everybody follows the rules. And this is a Mordensage one. So it's also a darkroom print that's been treated with the Mordensage chemicals. And this one got accepted for the, I think for the Mr. Rogers 
show last year? Yeah, I think it's I think it's what you had that one in. Yeah. So Beth, I know you described at least to me personally, if not to the club, it, would you review briefly the, this whole process? Because it's kind of interesting. <laughs> it's you take a a silver gelatin print on fiber paper that has some really good solid black areas in it. And you submerge the print in a bath of 40% hydrogen peroxide, glacial acetic acid, and cupric chloride in a, a little bit of water. So it does dilute it down some. Um, and it will lift off the emulsion from the paper only where it's really black. If it's too black, like if it's really been heavily exposed, it'll just completely disappear. But if it's just the right amount of black, then it lifts off the page, but it gives all those little veils around the edges. Mm -hmm. So when you're washing it and, and then you redevelop it and wash it more and fix it and wash it more, you can get the, the veils to sort of stick back to the paper, kind of where you want them. But I was actually with this one, I wanted to get just all of it still connected, but it, when you're washing, it's tough to control that and it split apart. So I just made, put them where I wanted them. Very clever. Beth, is that on a, on a white canvas? No, that's just the, the white of the photo paper. Behind the image, on the left or the yep. right side? Yeah. Oh. I print them so that there's a, a little bit more room between the yeah. image and the edge of the paper, so that when the veils go back down, they'll be outside the frame sometimes, yeah. and that gives them enough room. Uh, Beth? Mm -hmm. Are we looking at the negative or the positive? Does it come out when you project? Is it projection printed? Oh, oh yeah. no, it's already printed. You've you've it's already processed it. But are we looking at the positive or the negative? This is the positive, positive. print. Okay, thanks. You can actually do the process on negatives, but I haven't tried that yet. Got it. I want to. I just. Mm -hmm. It's a one-shot deal with that, so. Oh, yeah. Very unique, Beth. Thanks. And this is one of the first images that I did with 4 by 5 and it got submitted to a large format only exhibition in Oregon and got in. And they only chose 30 images and I think they had something like a, I don't know, it was almost 200 submittals and they chose 30. But these are tree roots that are next to Cucumber Falls. Brian knows where they are. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think Brian recognized them when he saw them the first time. When I when I looked through them the other day on a computer, I went, "Oh, I know where those are at." <laughs> <laughs> yep. I think you and I are probably have probably photographed those more than anything else in Cucumber Falls. <laughs> Possible. I know where they're at because I've seen Beth photographing them numerous times. <laughs> hey, congratulations. Thanks. Okay. Hey, thanks, Beth. Yep. Great, unique shots. Thanks, Beth. Okay. And yes, see. all dark room. Who's next here? Oh. Andy, you're up. All right. This is just to prove that you don't need a dark room or fancy equipment to make your way into shows. So um, don't be afraid to submit regardless of what you're using. So this is just out my kitchen window on a snowy day. 
Um, who can resist a cardinal in the snow? I think. Oh no, he stands out so much. In a, in a Chuck cherry it tree. perfectly. Mm -hmm. And I like the fact that his, his little, um, you know, top was kind of fanned out there. Um, yeah, I, it, and I don't know, for me, photography is a lot of luck. <laughs> so, yeah, with all um, of us, it's a lot of luck. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's like, yep. oh, wow, I, I really got that picture. And, and you, you know, you take a whole bunch and then hope for something. Um, so this was at um, the Art Nationals, Westmoreland Art Nationals one year, and it's currently in the Central PA Council for the Arts show um, up at Penn State, although it's a virtual show. Good for you. Lovely. It's a good thing it was a cardinal because any other plain bird, it obviously wouldn't make the photo. It's that, that spot of red there mm -hmm. and all the white. Yep. Right, yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. So this is another out my kitchen window. <laughs> Through the window? No, no, I opened the window. Um, okay. Yeah, there's always cold air blowing in the back of our house. Because, <laughs> uh, and it was, I mean, it was daytime and there was the moon. And when I, um, you know, zoomed in, I, I could get the moon behind the tops of some trees. Um, you have a good eye candy. That was Thanks. lovely. And I like that it's not in the center. You have it off to the right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I just, I, I, I particularly love the moon and um, I, there is so much um, night lighting around my house. Neighbors have all those mercury lights out and I rarely get a good nighttime shot of the moon. So um, I was real happy to get this daytime shot. Right. Love this one, Candy. Mm -hmm. Me too. I, I, um, and this is a mm -hmm. smartphone picture. <laughs> Yeah. Is that and, your cat? Is that your cat? Well, yeah, we just lost her in May. Oh. So, um, Sorry. Which, well, it, I mean, I am too. It, it happens though. So, um, Mom, yeah. So, this picture, how old was your cat? She was only five. Five. Oh, yeah. my. That was young. Oh, my. Yeah. She yeah. Ill? Uh, no, mm -mm, this was sudden and unexpected, so. Very dramatic. And you know, you really, it's hard to take a picture of a cat because as soon as you try to point a, pic, a camera at them, they they come to you. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> um, a lot of light in the eye really takes. Yeah, there was, there's a window and she was sitting on a, on a footstool and, and I just kept taking pictures of her. And then, so this was cropped, you know. Um, yeah, it's, it's one of my favorites. It, it was um, at the Fred Rogers Center this summer for the, um, that show and or the, at the Latrobe Art Center. And um, <laughs> when I had to take the picture in and drop it off, I felt really bad, like I was leaving my cat with someone. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so um, I don't think I'll enter her in anything that, that she has to be away from home for. <laughs> <laughs> she did win the photography prize at the Westmoreland Art Nationals. And um, she's in, she's in the um, black and white magazine um, smartphone contest. She's in their issue. Uh, yeah. Pictures from That's their smartphone you. contest. So, yeah, so she's a good one. Congratulations. 
Thanks, Candy. Mm -hmm. Any your oh, whoops, I'm sorry, hold on. <laughs> These are um, photos that I entered for the uh, Hannistown um, show that we did. Um, they wanted some good photos of um, Westmoreland County. Um, this is, of course, the Westmoreland Museum. It is not easy to get a full shot of that museum. <laughs> <laughs> not with the new addition on it. Um, took a photo walk one night and um, I got this shot. I really liked it. They liked it too. So it was, uh, we only ended up with 32. We ended up, I think our club submitted around 150 shots. And um, I got three of them in there. So they had 32 photos for our club for that show. So I like uh, how you can see into the building itself and into the hallway and you know, I think the lighting is pretty good. On that one. Lights definitely make it. Mm -hmm. Do you know what uh, focal length lens you used for that? Yeah, I think it was probably a 24. Um, I don't think it was an 18, but I it was as wide as I had. And without being in the middle of the street, because the, the museum's on a hill, so it's a little hard to get to a spot where you can, without getting your butt run over. And so you could get a good angle you know i'm standing i think at the very edge of that parking lot without you now i couldn't go back any further to get any any more of that and then it was hard to get the perspective because it, it's a building and sometimes you know your perspective gets warped mm -hmm. so to make sure that it's you know straight and you know the roof line's not looking like it's curved and the building's not curved so I was pretty happy with that shot mm -hmm. now this one of course is Ligonier this is a gazebo before they um, redid it. Um, the sky was, this was a, at the blue hour and the sky was pretty, um, had, uh, you know, just a lot of texture to it. And the wind was kicking up. Um, yeah, I like how the flag is moving. That's cool. Yeah, you can see it. Um, and I uh, just, uh, the flowers looked really pretty that night. The sky looked nice and I just took a few shots. And again, this was in Hannah, at Hannahstown in their new education center. And um, just like the sky, the sky helped to make the, the photo along with, you know, like you said, the movement of the flag. But this was before they renovated the, uh, the gazebo. Mm -hmm. And of course, you have the courthouse at night. Everybody loves the, uh, you know, different pictures and different angles of the courthouse. Um, I like taking, uh, I like the light trails that I captured going down to the courthouse. It helps to 
And they ended up being a lot of the same color that the courthouse dome was at that time. The, they had it lit so that everything was gold. So it was pretty cool. Um, How many seconds did you shoot that at? Um, that was probably a, probably anywhere between 20 and 30 seconds. Okay. Um, and they were just the cars going down and nothing coming up. So, um, yeah, I got them going down. I like the, the red and the gold and like the little yep. bit of the blue that ended up coming out of the couple of the lights down around the courthouse there. Added some color really like down. The light yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's good. Done, and all the details in the dome came out really nice. So, Annie, I'm curious, and I, I, I mean, I know where roughly where you took this photo from. Mm -hmm. in, in my mind, there's um, telephone poles and wires hanging all over the place, and I don't see them. Did Did you have to work to remove them, or did you just happen to have an angle where they weren't showing? Nope, I had got an angle that they they're not showing. Because okay. I don't like, I don't really like them, so I actually set myself up where I'm in the street, <laughs> where I shouldn't be, but I'm standing in the street with my tri, you know, I'm in my tripod, and um, so that I didn't get that. I think the telephone lines and that are on on the side of the street that I'm on. Um, so yeah. I was trying to not get any telephone poles or lights and, or the, you know, the lines, because I don't like them. <laughs> sounds sounds like it worked out well. No cars were coming up the street. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I, I have several, several <coughs> shots of this, um, and I specifically tried to wait till there was nothing coming up, you know, with the... Uh, you know, headlights shining in in my camera and just something coming down. So I timed this one so that I heard the car coming behind me and I started it, as you can see, you know, when it was like pretty much beside me, I started my timer on my camera so that I could get just that particular car and then there was another one that had been stopped at the at the red light. So, because I, I was, like I said, I was trying not to get the headlights coming up the hill so that I could get that. Nice. Thanks. Thanks, Annie. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Thank you. Good shots. Mm -hmm. Well, since I'm narrating this one, I can say we saved the best for last. <laughs> so the title of this one that I gave it was This Donkey Chews Mail Pouch. <laughs> um, and let's see here. So this got into the... Um, the Latrobe Art Center, the Fred Rogers show uh, back last year. Um, and it was in the Hannistown exhibit that Annie mentioned as well. Mm -hmm. And this one actually sold at Hannistown. Uh, mm -hmm. Someone liked Mill Pouch Barnes and bought it from me. But um, the reason I ended up taking this photo is this was back in 2016 and the club was having their monthly challenges with subjects and the subject that month was rustic and i i'm not too far from route 130 and i got on route 130 and just looked for old barns and farm equipment and whatnot this is out near Stallstown, and what i saw initially was just the barn and i wanted to get a photo of it and the, the donkey was uh, in the barn 
in here kind of in the shadows. And when I approached to take the photo, he got curious and came out and stuck his head on top of the post there or the rail. <laughs> and it was like he was just posing for me. He wanted to be in the photo. How charming, charming. So that, that was, was just... Bob Kendra who bought your photo, is it? I'm sorry? Did Bob Kendra buy your photo? Because Bob Kendra likes those type of photos. You know what? I, I was not told who bought it. I couldn't tell you because it, the, the, it went through the Hannistown people. They're the ones that sold them. So I just not got there. a check in the mail. I, don't, I have no idea who bought it. That's interesting, though, that you might know who it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's into those, and he belongs to Hannah's Town, so, yeah. Oh, okay. Bob Kendra? Yes. All right, I might inquire about that one. That's funny. <laughs> Did you say that, that corn's in uh, Stallstown? It's, it's just outside of Stallstown on Route 130. It's the, I, I think the name of the farm is the Phyllis Farm. Hmm. I know I'd seen that, that barn someplace before, but I couldn't remember where I'd seen it. So I've yep. been out up Route 30 up through Stallstown and that plenty of times. Yeah. What's the word in, above mail pouch? Chew. 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 Yep. Hmm? happened here. Okay, I'm not sure. Oh, got a delay there somehow. So those of you who know Twin Lakes, this is the lower lake at Twin Lakes and the boathouse in the distance. Uh, I, 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 Pat and I do a lot of walking at Twin Lakes, and I think I just happened to be there at the right time as far as the conditions go to get the cloud reflections in the lake. To me, that, that's kind of what made the photo itself. And um, this one, it just turned out, this was back in 2017, and it turned out Westmoreland County Parks and Recreation had a photo contest, so I submitted it for the contest and it ended up winning in the landscape category. Um, and as a result, and I didn't know this was gonna happen, but I instantaneously became a professional photographer because <laughs> I, I won $100 cash prize. And this is, I call a walk in the alley. Uh, this was at the Fred Rogers uh, exhibit last summer. And it also got into the Westmoreland Nationals last year as well. Um, I, I spent a couple of hours, this photo was taken in, this was in 2017. And I just, I was walking around Greensburg, both on the main streets and in the alleys, just taking photos of whatever I happened to come across. And these two people happened to be walking down out through the alley away from me. And it just seemed like it was an interesting shot with them silhouetted and the bright background and everything that you see in an alley there, if you will. Um, so yeah, this is kind of one of my, and it, obviously it really worked in black and white as well. Yeah. You shot it in color and then converted it. To yes. black and white. Yes. Mm -hmm. well, it looks and, like you're shooting, shooting from Pittsburgh Street down to Otterman Street in one alley. That is correct, yeah. Jimmy, yeah, yeah I'm a little, little familiar with Greensburg. Yeah. Now, Jim. I recognize the, uh, the vent from the one restaurant <laughs> <laughs> on that wall. It's very distinctive. One yep. of those places is very distinctive. Jim, if you did this in color, probably wouldn't have the same effect as it is in black and white. I don't think so, no. Mm -hmm. so. And now my, uh, 
my post-processing skills, particularly back that time frame, were not all that good. But I will direct you to a part of the photo that I felt quite proud of myself. <laughs> but um, this brick wall down here, in the edge here, there was one of those huge um, trash bins um. in here. And um, although I liked overall the, the messiness of the alley itself, I didn't like the trash can coming in because of Brian's influence on me from the edge of the frame. So um, I was able to clone that out of there. And I mean, if, if, if I zoomed in and you looked closely, you would see there's some errors in there, but from a distance, the bricks look half decent. So I, was, I was pleased with that post-processing part of it. If you hadn't pointed it out, nobody would know. No, so. you would. That, it's it's kind of like when you paint a room and you screw up a brush stroke near the ceiling. <laughs> yeah. You're the only one that sees it. Okay, so that's it for the juried photos. Uh, so let's see. What's next on the agenda is to go through a review of Luminar 4, which is the current version of the Luminar software. And this is going to be a combination of a maybe a 10 slide PowerPoint presentation just to go over some major items. But then I'll go ahead and go into Luminar itself and just show you around the interface a little bit. So let's see here where I need to go. We should start at the beginning. Okay, so Luminar is made by Skylum Software. And it's a, it's a complete photo management and editing program that is pretty much directly comparable to Lightroom. Uh, but what's unique about Luminar, and we've talked about this at several of our meetings previously, so this shouldn't come as a surprise to you, it's primarily based on the use of artificial intelligence to assist in your post-processing. Um, now, when I say it's comparable to Lightroom, and I think I've mentioned this before, um, it is not, from an editing standpoint, it's sophisticated. From a photo management standpoint, it's ridiculously basic. And therefore, if you're interested in using Luminar, uh, my personal suggestion is to treat it simply as a plug-in for Lightroom or whatever other post-processing program you might use. You, you don't want to use it standalone in place of Lightroom. I think you would be really disappointed in it. So, um, First, I'm going to play this real quick video that just gives you like a real quick overview of it. And I hope this works with using Zoom here. I'm not sure what's going to happen. Okay, I guess we're going to be able to see it. Can you see the video? Yes. So I know that's a little quick, but I think it, what it kind of points out is um, how much it can do with so little effort on your part. 
Do you use Luminar 4? Um, I, I have my own copy of it, and I occasionally play with it. Um, and as a for instance, Annie, I'm, I'm not sure the, the proposal we went in, sent into the museum the other day, on the cover page, I've got a pano of the front of the museum. Mm -hmm. And um, the sky, although the lighting on the museum was beautiful because it was early morning, um, the sky was a dull, I'm not sure if it was gray or pure blue at that point. I mm -hmm. went ahead and used Luminar to put the dramatic clouds into that photo. So cool. I, I've used it, but I'm, I'm not proficient at it yet. Um, Michael's not on the call. I think Michael at least uses it somewhat. And mm -hmm. I'm not sure, I've not heard any of our other, well, no, Brian has played with it as well. So how much does it cost? Um, now, this is the new Luminar AI. I'm using Luminar 4. Luminar AI is coming out sometime later this year. Uh, it's supposed non-Black Friday price would be $79. So it is a very inexpensive program if you're interested. Now, Black Friday and Cyber Monday sales, um, you can get some discounts on them. And so if you're an existing Luminar user, uh, the two seats are getting it to use on two different computers, if you will. Uh, but one seat, it's $64 right now for an existing owner and $69 for a, a new customer. So yeah. pretty inexpensive. Jim, uh, is, are these updated regularly with free of charge? Or is this uh, just a standalone and that's it? You have to pay extra for updates down the road. Uh, you, so it's, it's a, um, a standalone, perm, what do they call it? A perpetual license, I guess, technically. Uh, you, you buy it once and you've got it forever. So I've owned it for the last year. They've had a, I think they had three updates at no charge over the last year where they would either fix bugs or add some new features. Um, so you can decide now, and we'll talk a little bit later on about Luminar AI. Um, this isn't like, you know, Lightroom version 6.2 to Lightroom 7.2. Um, they're completely, I, well, I hate to say this, the engine behind the interface is being completely changed for this new Luminar AI. Uh, apparently, it was originally developed a few years ago for Apple, for Mac computers. Um, and then they decided, well, we might as well go ahead. It was being a little bit successful. They decided to open it up to PC users. But the, apparently, the, the, the software um, platform, although it, it could be used on PCs, it, it wasn't that efficient either. And, and I noticed that a little bit, it's a little bit slow. So the, this, up, this new version that's coming out later this year, Luminar AI, um, is complete gut and rebuild of the program plus new AI based features. Uh, technical requirements, um, not a whole lot of RAM uh, for Macs. It's eight gigabytes uh, for the Windows. It's eight gigabytes. Um, I don't think the processes are anything unusual there. So, if you have a relatively recent computer, it, it should work on it. And I mentioned it using it as a plugin. It it is integrate. You can. They're compatible with each other as far as you can use it directly as a plugin for Lightroom. So um, what are some of the features of Luminar 4? Just to go out, it is a catalog-based system, similar to Lightroom. Uh, it's a little bit different in that it uses layers for the various uh, filters that are available for it. And it all, so it includes opacity and blend modes like you might see in, in, in Photoshop. Uh, masking, 
although the masking controls are rather simplistic, it has what they call looks, which are presets that you can apply. Uh, it uses filters to apply special effects, and we'll see some of those later on. And then it has a whole slew of this artificial intelligence editing tools, where basically there's a slider and you apply these effects, and I'll show you those later. But there's what's called AI accent, which is a complete auto edit, if you will, of the photo. Uh, there's a sky enhancer uh, that basically allows you to darken the, an overblown sky and bring out the details without having to do any masking or any layering. Um, AI structure is providing smart clarity, I'll call it, to your photo. So you can apply the structure without worrying about are you applying too much. For instance, maybe there was some rocks or a sandy beach or something that you wanted to bring out and enhance the details. Uh, but you didn't want it to hit the sky in any fashion. So the AI structure is supposedly smart enough to know where to apply the structure and where not to apply it. Uh, the AI sky replacement, uh, you don't like your sky, pick another sky, whether one that's provided in the program or one that you happen to have on one of your photos you can put on a new photo. Uh, the augmented sky, and Brian showed this to us in one of the more recent meetings. To me, it's kind of silly, but you can put things in the sky that aren't normally there, like dinosaurs. And <laughs> it's, yeah. it's strange. But, but, well, you can add things like clouds and, and lightning, too. But there's, they, there are standard things that you can add, I think, are almost silly but nevertheless, it's in there. If you like to play games with your photos. The enhanced skin enhancer is like magic. Um, if Rex is still on the call, um, I'm not sure how many hours Rex might have spent touching up portraits over the years. Basically, this is a slider back and forth. Pimples, no pimples. Um, shine, no shine. It's it's, it truly is like magic. Well, and that goes along with the portrait enhancer as well. I hear you. Pardon me? I hear you. Oh, okay. I, when you said um, AI structure, I was thinking of the uh, radio filter in Lightroom where you can open up a uh, egg shape or a circle um, or some fashion, something in that fashion and then just uh, shoot the light into it, either very, very gently or um, as much as you need. Um, I, I find I've used it, I've used it where you have a group of people in a picture and some of them, their faces are just a little bit dark. So you could take that radial filter and lighten them just a, a little bit or more if you need. Mm -hmm. Well, what you'll find when we get into Luminar itself, what you're going to find is you'll be able to say things like, I can do that in Lightroom. I can do that in Photoshop. Yes, you can, but the simplicity of using this and the time saving is what makes it really stand out. Now, I think sometime within the last month at one of our meetings, we talked about Photoshop, I think, has seen the competition it's getting from Luminar. And you'll see Photoshop is starting to come out with a lot of these AI enhanced effects that Luminar currently has and is developing. So maybe this time next year, we'll all say, well, that was fine that Luminar had it, but I can do all of that in Photoshop and or Lightroom now or whatever other post-processing program you might be using. Because I think a lot of them see this as genuine competition and are beginning to um, mimic that to a certain extent. So um, in Luminar, there's an import feature um, and literally all you do is import the photos. There's, there's not like presets that you can use. It's very, very, very basic. The library module, you can do the color and numerical ratings. There's albums. There's nothing else. There's no metadata. Um, there's not really any search features. It's really, really just the basics. Uh, the export function, 
you can export it, a JPEG, a TIFF, et cetera, um, with very basic changes in, um, in settings. But again, very, very, very basic and simplistic. Um, so, and we'll see this in the edit window. It has several tabs, if you will. There's a layers tab, a canvas tab where you do crop, erase, clone, stamp, lens and geometry changes. The essentials tab is your typical um, highlights and shadows. There's also some of the AI enhanced tools there. There's what they call a creative tab that has the filters and the AI sky tools. There's a portrait tab. And then there's a pro tab that has some other um, uh, features to it, tools that you can use. Uh, we're gonna skip this video just for time, but uh, Jim Nix um, has a series of YouTube tutorials on using Luminar. So if you're into YouTube and like to spend the time, Jim Nix, I would recommend to you. He does a really nice job uh, going over the various tools and how to use them. So what are the drawbacks using Luminar? Um, I mentioned some of these already. The library, there's no access to metadata. There's no keywording. Uh, you can search by a, the searching using the filters limited, just the ratings that you apply in Luminar. There's manual albums that you can use, uh, but no smart albums. The import export print features are minimal. There's no file renaming. There's no import presets. There's no virtual copies if you like to use those. Although it has layers, there's no auto align feature in layers. So you best have used a tripod if you're trying to do a composite or a blended photo of some sort. Uh, there is masking to apply the effects. The controls are fairly elementary. Uh, there's a luminosity mask, but there's no adjustments available to it. It just gives you a basic uh, a dark to white luminosity mask. And the only thing you can really do with it is to invert it if you want to use the, the opposite of it. But you can't adjust it like you could in, in Photoshop. So what resources are available? Uh, Luminar has a website. You would look under Skylum because that's the name of the company, S-K-Y-L-U-M. And then uh, YouTube, Luminar has a bunch of YouTube videos. And then uh, both Jim Nix, who I mentioned earlier, and then another one, Anthony Morganti. Uh, both Anthony and Jim have a really nice set of instructional videos on how to use the software. They both do a really, really step-by-step, -step, this is how you do it type tutorial. Um, so Luminar AI is coming out later this year. It's available for pre-order now. So like those uh, Black Friday, uh, Cyber Monday sales that I showed you earlier, you can order them, order it now, but you're not gonna get anything yet. It, it won't come out and they, they haven't really given a date other than the holidays. So sometime between um, Thanksgiving and Christmas is what, what you would think it might be. Um, so with that, I'll, I'm going to hold the questions. And bring up Luminar. When I say hold the questions, I, as we're going through the, the program itself, certainly feel free to ask any questions. So um, this is the screen. This is, you see the library here. I'm in the library module. And I just put in a, a few photos here just so that we might be able to play with them. And let's see here, I'm gonna move you guys out of here. Um, so just real quickly, just to kind of give you an idea of how, not simple to use, but how simplistic the program is, um, I'll just go through the selections, through the, the, the main uh, menu selections up here at the top. Um, it's basically add and import preferences, nothing much there. Um, edit, library albums, um, image, you can set the ratings, uh, the colors, the flags, the numbers. You can rotate it and flip it. Um, not a whole lot there views of the, the actual screen itself. Um, 
There's the export and um, let's see if do I have a, I have a select. Let's say if I wanted to export an image, um, you can tell it where you want to go and give it a different file name and the different attributes, the different file type. Um, that's kind of about it. Uh, so library program, well, and so the other thing is like I said, no metadata. So this photo here, here's the info. That's the only info, info that you have available for that photo. You can get a histogram. Uh, in this case, it's the, oh, let's see, let me get this out of here. Um, the camera, the lens, uh, the standard exposure uh, items, and that's it. Um, there's no other information available to you within the program itself. So let's just take this first one and we'll go over to the edit module. And um, this is a raw photo. This is at Mammoth Park. And by the way, while we're right now, it's creating a preview. If you notice, there's nothing lit up over here. So it's not sit back and drink a cup of coffee, but, and it might be because I have so many windows open right now, it's there, okay? So now it's ready to be edited. So you can see that there had to be at least 20 second delay there before I could do anything with the photo. Hopefully the new Luminar AI will be quicker responding, but I think this is one of the issues with the Windows users. So if we were just going to do a standard Lightroom type edit, here's your temperature and exposure controls that you would normally kind of see and the, 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 the controls operate just like they would in Lightroom. So it would, it, wouldn't be very difficult for you to get the program, import a photo, and work on it, just like you would today in Lightroom. So um, that's kind of the normal situation. The AI enhance is where the magic starts happening. And um, I'll just start over here and start pulling across the slider and you can kind of watch the photo while I'm pulling across and it's basically doing the processing for me. And that's it at 100%. And if you think, well, well, let's just go ahead and show before and after. There's before, obviously the shadows needed opened up a little bit. And there's the after. So it did a fairly good job of developing the photo. And if you don't like to what extent it did, you can slide it down and find something in between that you might like. Um, so this one, the sky's pretty good. I haven't really tried this one. I'll, I'll just leave this here. So the sky enhancer, um, and this might not be the best photo to work on here, but we'll try this one just since we've got the photo open. We'll just start sliding this. And basically what it does, it's like applying a gradient filter to the sky is the best way I could describe it. It's just going to start darkening things up. And um, so if you, if this, this sky really wasn't blown out, but if it had been blown out, it would go ahead and basically correct that for me. So in fact, let's go back and get a different. Wow, this is slower than it normally is. It's Part trying to match the library cool. right now. Jim? Yeah. Uh, what I was watching is the reflection in the bottom to see if it only did the upper third or so, or if it actually was looking for that, uh, uh, that number of pixels. It, 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 well, I'm, what did you notice? Because I'm pretty sure it's just looking at the I, sky. I, I was watching for it. It didn't seem to, but if you had maybe done well, all I, all I can say is I couldn't see that the bottom part changed, but I was only just beginning to get the idea of, hey, should, that's maybe where I should be watching to see how much of the image that it affects. Yeah. Well, since I don't have any other really good ones to enhance, yeah. 
we'll go back to that one just for that purpose, I guess. Well, I would say, you know, if you took it to the original image without anything and then just use the sky enhance and see what happens to the bottom. Well, of course, it's going to do its thing again. <laughs> it, not, and I wouldn't try to sell this program to you, but it's <laughs> lower than it normally is tonight. Um, okay. Let me take the, okay, so that's the, let me make sure it's reset there. Okay. So that's the original photo. Yeah. And I'm going to keep my eye on the bottom. <laughs> yeah. I don't see the bottom changing at all, Rex. I don't either. Yeah. Okay. So it's below the level that it's interested in. Yep. So I'm going to turn, I'm going to reset those. And we'll just go down there. So that's the AI enhance. And by the way, if for some reason it was you wanted to mask the effect, you can apply some masking to it as well. Um, the AI structure, you know what, I'm going to, I, I know this takes a while, I'm going to go to a different photo for this. So this is Blackwater Falls. Yep. Sure is. And da 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 da. Okay, so AI structure, and you can do a negative and a positive structure. I haven't really played with the negative, but I'll just pop it up to the top here. Now, obviously, I don't think most of us would post process to that extent. Um, Yeah, so somewhere in between is, you know, where and it's obviously your taste. You can mask it if you want. But what I think is worth noting here is, um, let me reset that. Um, as much as it did the rocks and the trees and whatnot, take a look at the waterfall itself when I jack this thing up. There, there is some enhancement there. I thought maybe it wouldn't be quite as much, but it, it, but it is. But supposedly, the, the, the idea is it, it doesn't overdo structure where it shouldn't overdo structure. And the boost, I think, if for some reason 100% doesn't give you enough, you can jack it up some more, I guess. Uh, I don't like that at all. No. Yeah, kind of gets disgusting. So anyway, that's the AI structure. What falls is that, Jim? Blackwater Falls, West Virginia. Huh? Blackwater Falls State Park. It's beautiful down there. I'd recommend it. There's some other streams that go into this. This is the Blackwater River. It's, it, mm -hmm. There's not a whole lot of big towns. It's near Davis, West Virginia. Yeah. Um, but it is another thing that's in the area is... Um, Canaan Valley State Park, which is not as scenic as Blackwater Falls, but what's really interesting down in that general area is um, Dolly Sod's uh, natural, Dolly Sod's natural area? Yep. I'm sorry, Dolly Sod's, Dolly Sod's wilderness area. Um, that's a unique place to go. Yep. Um, so, let me see here. So that's the structure, um, color controls, um, saturation and vibrance, and then the advanced settings. It's the typical thing that you would see in Lightroom. Although uh, there's no picker. So, you know, if I wanted to go pick and see exactly what color the, the trees are back there, although I can see it's kind of greenish, the, there's no picker here. So you have to kind of do the selections on your own. Uh, black and white conversion, and it's kind of what you would expect. Um, you can go ahead and alter the, the individual colors. There's no reds in there probably. There should be some greens. That's fine. You'd think there'd be more an effect on that. Yeah. Oh, you, you know what? I'm sorry. That was on the luminance. I wanted to be here, I think. Oh, no, that's just the saturation. Okay, I expected more of an effect there. But anyway, there is a black and white conversion. Uh, details enhancer, 
this is like your clarity control, uh, small details, medium details, large details. I don't know if, does Lightroom go into like the small, medium, and large? What, on the details? No. Yeah. No. It just, it, okay. So what's, this is a little bit different. Um, and what would be good is, a, I don't think I have a photo here to show this effect. Let's say you were at a sandy beach. So there was sand and maybe some pebbles and then maybe some larger rocks. Um, the details enhancer, you can selectively, it seeks out like fine details using the small details slider and similarly medium details and large details. So you can kind of select what you want to improve the clarity on, if that makes any sense. Uh, there's a denoise feature. I don't, I've never played with, I don't know how well it works. The landscape enhancer, so it has a dehaze function. Uh, you know, let me go back to color and get rid of that black and white conversion. Oh, no one. Okay, so landscape enhancer. Um, there's not a whole lot of dehaze there, but it'll probably, yeah, it shows it. So there's the dehaze at work. Although in this case, uh, it just can decrease the dehaze, it can't increase haze, if you will. Uh, the golden hour, I assume it's just adjusting the temperature. You can see it warming it up and the foliage enhancer improves, enhances the greens if you wanna perk them up a little bit. And then you can apply a vignette. So that's the essentials tab. Um, here's the layers if, so you could apply like all the filters to a layer so you can selectively take them in and out or adjust the opacity of them. Uh, the canvas tool has an erase clone and stamp tool uh, the lens and geometry as far as doing the keystoning correction. Uh, crop and rotate's kind of typical. Uh, so we'll go down here to the creative tab and I'm gonna change photos here. Okay, this is, um, just for your information, this is Bethany Beach, a uh, bridge that crosses over the bay from one side to the other, slid up nice at night. Uh, so this one, let's say, oh, it's still, so I'm sorry, it's waiting to set up a preview for me to work on. There we go. So let's say I just don't like that sky. Now, one of the, there's a whole, you can see there's 20 some skies that I can pick from here, or down here you can load a custom sky, which is one that you create and it tracks it there for you. Um, the bad thing is like, you would think that, and maybe with the, the next version of it, it'll happen. It would be nice to see a preview of these skies on your image as you go mm -hmm. through, but you don't. And there's not even a thumbnail here to even give you an idea of what the sky is. But I'll just pick one out of each category here. Although blue sky probably isn't gonna enhance this photo. Oh, it gave me some nice clouds. Now, here's what's kind of interesting. Um, and I'll zoom in in a bit, but you see it put clouds under the bridge deck. It put them behind the, uh, the uh, support cables. Although here, you see here, it yep. didn't quite work, but what you've got here, and I, I've not learned how to use these, but keep an eye out on the cables here. And I think this closed gaps takes care of this because I played with another photo yesterday it, with some trees. And it, it kind of did the same thing, and the trees didn't have leaves, so it was just all branches. And it kind it of did the same thing to the tree. But if I slide this closed gaps, 
it knows that you're not pleased with it. See them coming in? Yeah. Over here. Um, there we go. So um, you can play with this thing if it's not quite now. What's interesting, I closed the gap and it took all the clouds away from underneath here. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, again, I, is this thing perfect? I obviously we just proved it probably isn't perfect. Um, you know what, it, what else it did? It took your telephone lines out that that you have there on the left hand side. Oh, interesting. Well, that was a good thing. Yeah, that yeah, that part I, I liked. It took your telephone lines yeah. out that yeah. were over there, with the exception yeah. of the couple of spots and the yeah. couple. Of, yeah. So let me see if I can get there on, just, on the edge. Yeah. So there's my bottom clouds back, and it's so again. Whether you can play with it, get it by masking, um, I'm not quite sure what all is possible. The sky local, I'm not even sure what that does, to be honest with you. I can't exactly tell. But anyway, you can mm -hmm. get this and play with it to your, to your heart's content. It's interesting what it can do. So that's, that's the blue sky um, here's a dramatic sky. Ooh, I like that one. Although, again, it, the, from a lighting perspective, the sky and the water don't look like they belong together. Yeah. But you can, so there's a sky temperature here. I should be able to cool the sky off and get a little bit better of a match, maybe. Mm -hmm. Um sky expo i haven't played with these so that don't yell at me for not knowing what i'm doing because i don't know what i'm doing but it, it i i just i wanted to show that there are adjustments that you can make it's just not a matter of sticking a sky on and that's the end of the story the relight the scene um and i don't know if this is a good photo to show it but maybe it does it um it does try to correct for the difference between the sky you picked and the rest of the photo. And I don't see it on this one. It might be because it's a night. It is changing the tone somewhat. Mm -hmm. um, but let's see. Let's just go through. Ooh, sunset. Again, this one maybe needs some work, but do you see how I got the blue here? The horizon, no, that's the horizon. I thought there's a way to shift the sky around. Sky portable. No, it's not on it. The horizon position, you can change what the, 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 the fake clouds, if you will, you can change their position within the frame. Huh. Uh, so I think that's enough time on that. It's just kind of give you an idea what you can possibly do with it. Here's the strange one. Oh, oh mate, I'm sorry, let me reset this one. Augmented oh. sky. Object selection. What would you like to include in our sky? Birds. Birds? You do birds three. Ooh, actually, that like enhances that. this photo. Uh, there's this place object, so I'm going to click it, and I want them just up here, right? Oh, man, did I time that photo good or what? That's cool. <laughs> that is one of my best photos right there. I got them right between the guide wires. But it's still kind of, whoops, hold on, I'm sorry, not that one. Birds three. I think this was the 4th of July, too. Okay, now no, that's no. interesting. I don't know if you can get more than one on or not. You might have to do it by layers if you wanted additional... Brian, you use this thing. Do you have to do an additional layer to get more than one object? He's not talking. Wake him up. So anyway, you can light up the sky, if you will. So that's kind of cool. 
As far as the stupid things, though, um, well, at least I thought they were stupid. Hold, oops, what happened? Jim, to answer your question, the answer is yes. You use multiple uh, multiple layers to get different objects. Okay, so here's one. I, maybe there's not a whole lot of these, but a giraffe. Really? Does anybody want to have a giraffe? But notice, <laughs> yeah. notice that it put the giraffe behind the bridge. <laughs> maybe not the guide wires, but... Big giraffe. <laughs> I think that's the giraffe from the zoo the other day, Annie. Yep, yep. So anyway, you can. We should add Godzilla. Our our giraffe was friendlier though. <laughs> uh, let's move on. Sun rays. Um, yeah, let's get a different photo. Oh, go, go uh, to the desert. Well, here, we'll put it on. We'll put on this one. Okay, so this is a sunset, and uh, this looks like a good place here. It's kind of blown out to put some sun rays in. Oh, it's. I'm sorry. I got to wait for the preview again. There we go. So now I haven't we'll put it over here. And then here's the amount. So there's the sun rays over Greensburg. Um, you can play with the length of them. And I'm not sure penetration. I guess it's just maybe how bright or how far they go. So anyway, if you want to add sun, you can add sun rays. Um, then I'll tell you what, I'm not going to spend the time on these. These are different filters that you can apply that um, kind of can soften the, uh, the photo or provide different junk to them. Um, there is a fog application here. Um, Here's the amount. Now, what I can tell you, the new version of AI, Illuminar AI, this fog is updated where Luminar knows the foreground versus the background, and it will put the fog starting in the background, and then you can adjust it to bring it further into the foreground of the photo. It, it looks pretty cool if you like to add fog to your photos. Hmm. Uh, real quick, I'm gonna go to portrait. I know we're, in fact, we're at nine o'clock. Let me just give me five more minutes if it's okay, and we'll do the portrait. Because that's kind of cool. Rex might appreciate this. Now, unfortunately, I didn't have any beautiful models to work with. <laughs> that's for sure. So here's a selfie of Jim. <laughs> uh, I was going to say I'd send you an image to work with, but after seeing this, never mind. <laughs> well, I, I look at now, it this way. If you can do something with that picture, this software is worth it. <laughs> <laughs> now, I got to tell you, this is a JPEG. So I don't know how well this works on JPEGs, to be quite honest. I, I, I just, I do not know. Um, but we'll start with the skin enhancer. Now, I've got, you know, thousands of marks on my skin, like everywhere. So we're just going to slide this across. Don't watch me slide, kind of watch me instead and see if you notice anything. It gets waxy. Yeah, now, so obviously that got, now again, this is a JPEG, so I don't know if it's, it's looking so gimmicky because it's a JPEG or not. Uh, and of course, the, you can vary the amount as well. And again, the AI skin enhancer and the AI portrait enhancer are being improved in the new Luminar AI. So 
don't judge it based on this demonstration. Um, shine removal, um, I don't know if this is shine necessarily, I'm not sure if it'll take it away, but let's see what happens right over here inside of my head. Um, Thank you. I think I'm seeing an effect. Wrinkles. Pardon me? <laughs> wrinkles, we need wrinkles. <laughs> Hey, there's no wrinkles on that face. Wrinkles. Okay, let's see. Let's uh, look see what look we on can the forehead. Let's see, see if we can get rid of them up there. All right. Um, face light can just relight the face. It knows the face versus the rest of the photo. Uh, there's no red eye. I, white. Let's see. Let me zoom in here. Look at those gray eyebrows. Where the wow. hell did they come from? <laughs> I don't know, but I got a couple of those suckers. Um, so let's try eye whitening. Now again, keep in mind, this is without any masking on my part. The thing just knows where the whites of the eyes are. Mm. Um, the eye enhancer. Um, it's just kind of, it's adding some, I'll call it clarity to the yeah. eyes. Um, in this case, I'm so well lit, the dark circle removal, I don't think it's going to show anything. But if there, well, you can see it lightening them up. So if there were dark circles under the eyes, it would lighten them up. Um, you think my eyes are too small? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's a, that's a new one for making your eyes pop out of your head. <laughs> Improve the eyebrows. <laughs> it just adds some detail to them. Yeah. I'm starting to look really good. <laughs> Your opinion. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see here. Lip saturation. I normally do use a very light red lipstick. Let's see if I can simulate that. <laughs> It's just picking up the lower lip here. Apparently, there's not enough red for it to detect the upper lip, but you can see what it did to the lower lip. Yeah, wait a minute. You oh, wait, lip redness. Lip, lip, lip redness. There lip you redness. go. Oh, I'm looking better now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Put um, that lipstick on there, man. Look okay. at that lipstick now, on. No, no, those of you who have seen my teeth know how god ugly my teeth are. So, <laughs> And I don't have a big smile here, but you can see how yellow, particularly these two are here. Teeth whitening. Now the problem is because my teeth are so different, it really over whitened the white one that was already there. Yep. In fact, it might not even have known that was a tooth. But again, <laughs> you can mask if you need to mask. So anyway, Rex. What do you think you could do with your portraits with this baby? Um, I'd be a while. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I was, uh, earlier you had mentioned the uh, graduated filter. Well, well, you had mentioned uh, one of the, uh, the filters that uh, you were wondering about whether what Lightroom had similar to it. But in the graduated filter, it also had uh, texture, clarity, and dehaze. And in the radial filter, there's also texture, clarity, and dehaze. Uh, well, but it, answer, this is an example of, you can do all that stuff in Lightroom. You just can't do it as easy. Yeah. Um, but to answer your question, uh, I would try. <laughs> I'd try. Um, the, uh, what, I, what I would, uh, what, what my notion is first is that it's a wide angle lens and it's up really close. We got to get rid of what I used to call Jiminy Cricket. And uh, if you can remember the Jiminy Cricket cartoons where the ears were so far back, there almost weren't any. And mm -hmm. uh, so I would be looking to uh, use one of the uh, uh, optic, optical distortion filters to reverse that. Well, you know what that reminds me of? Um, the, the new AI, if, if, if I was standing there um, and I've got a little bit of a pot belly, uh, it has a, a, a tummy tucker. 
if you will. <laughs> um, and it does have the, uh, the face that you can um, skinny it or fatten the face as well. Uh, lens correction is what I was grasping for. Oh, lens, okay. cor lens correction feature. Yeah. Hey. Hey, Tucker, I could use that. So, um, yeah, I think that's it. Unless somebody has any questions or wants to see one of the features. Very nice. Yep. Looks like it has some cool tools. And you yeah, said it can be it can be used as a um, along with uh, Lightroom. Like you can use it go from Lightroom to that. But can you go from back into Lightroom with that? Well, it'll be a TIFF file, just like, I think just like any plug-in program, you, you send out a TIFF and you get a TIFF back. So what I mean is like, you know, there, there's times I take my photo from Lightroom and go into Photoshop and then go from Photoshop back into Lightroom with my photo. Can I do the same thing with that? Well, so, um, so you've got a raw file in Lightroom. Mm -hmm. In order to edit it in Luminar, um, it's going to create a TIFF file, unless you just simply decide to take your raw file directly. I think this is right. I, I, boy, you know what? There's some chance I might be wrong on this, but I'm pretty sure as a plugin, Lightroom will send over a TIFF copy of the photo and you'll edit it in Luminar and save it as a TIFF and you'll get it as a TIFF back in Lightroom. So you, you will no longer be working on your raw file. <coughs> so I'll lose some of my information then. You, you would. No, but it, the original file is still intact. You, oh, you're, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Your original file hasn't been touched. So what, I, what I'm saying is what if there's like, uh, one or two of the editing tools that I want to use in the in Luminar and then send my picture back into the Lightroom so I can finish using you know well, Lightroom will edit will process a TIFF file. Can I can I try to translate what what I think if I translate what she's saying? Go ahead. Is that you started out in Lightroom, you took it to Luminar, you did your work, you took that back to Lightroom. You looked at it in Lightroom, you saw, oh, I need to do something more in Luminar. And you ping pong it back into Luminar again. So I think the answer to the question is probably yes. But after some time, it's going to show its uh, wear and tear. So you have to be very careful with whatever manipulations you're doing to it. I don't know if that helps or not. Oh, because every time it'll create a new copy. There you go. Yeah, but you can ping pong it probably as many times as you want. Yeah, yeah. but I, I didn't know if I would lose any of the, the details or the information that I had on the original raw file, you know. Andy, what, what are you talking about as far as details? Are you referring to the work that you did in Lightroom first? Yeah, I'm like the, talking about the, like being able to like go back and forth. Say there's something that that works that I feel that works better in Luminar than in Lightroom. And I started in Lightroom and I did a few few of the edits that I wanted in Lightroom. Okay. But then yeah. I took it took it over to Luminar and worked on it over there. And then I wanted to take and do a, something else to it in Lightroom and take it back. Am I going to lose um, some of my information? Yes. And that's the way Lightroom works. And I don't care if you use that or uh, something else. Even if you send it to Photoshop and back, uh, when you send it to Photoshop or you send it to another program, it makes a copy. It sends it as a TIFF file. It comes back as a TIFF file as a second, as a second picture right next to the original one. With a new name. With a new name. It'll say, you know, one, two, three, four, edit. And you okay. can edit, 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 dot right. tiff files. Okay. Right. But each time you do that, anything that you've done in Lightroom, it doesn't, it doesn't send the history back and forth. That's right. So when it comes back, none of the history that you did the first time will still will be attached to the new picture. 
Yeah, but your okay. original raw file is always left alone. Right. Okay. All right. That's all I was wondering. Well, and then just one follow up, Annie, is if you started Lightroom, did some edit, took the Luminar, put some enhancements on, took it back to Lightroom, and you thought to yourself, oh darn, I want to change something in Luminar that I did previously. Mm -hmm. That change is burnt into the TIFF yeah. file that it sent back to you. So you, you'd literally need to start over again. Oh, I'm not sure I like that. Mm. Now, wait, I, I take that back slightly. The TIFF that Luminar sent back to you, um, you, you, could, you could import that directly back into Luminar and start again, but you couldn't undo what you had done. That, I'm oh. not sure I said that right or not. Yeah. Oh, I, I have a question. Does, uh, when you have taken the image over to Luminar, does it create its own dot something like dot LMU? or something like that, so that that file stays there in your Luminar folder, so that um, you could work with what it is you send back to, in other words, you make a copy, and that copy is a Luminar, it's a, a your image dot Luminar. Rex, you yeah, to answer your question, yes, that, that TIFF okay. file um, would, would continue to read, the TIFF file would continue to read. So let's take, you see in my, we edited my photo here. You see those little lines there? That just telling me in the library module that this photo has had some adjustments made to it. So even if I exported this back to Lightroom, my photo with the, ch the act, the changes being active and re-editable are still available in Luminar. I, so, so I think that says yes to your, your question. There, there, but there, there's not a, there's not a side, I'm gonna call it a sidecar. I'm not sure that's the correct terminology to use. Um, Beth would tell you she uses on one photo raw that actually has a little sidecar file that stores all the editing information. Um, and we're going to talk about uh, on one next month, it's kind of a similar review. In the case of Luminar, there's not really a sidecar type file. It's just the catalog, just like Lightroom's catalog saves all those edits for you. Luminar is doing the same thing. It's saving all the edits within the catalog. Okay. Okay, we're 15 after. That's probably long enough for a meeting. Um, we can talk about Luminar again in the future if anybody's interested. Um, I know Brian has used it a little bit. Has anybody else on the call used it? No. No. Mm. Okay. Um, it's, you know, I mean, I know every dollar is important to you, but it's pretty inexpensive. Um, it couldn't hurt you to get a copy and see what you can do with it because you, it definitely allows you to do enhancements that at least in my case, I would spend a lifetime in Lightroom and Photoshop trying to duplicate. Um, I'll tell you the uh, one thing that you showed us this evening that got my attention is I really like the way in the landscapes you were able to take sunlight or skylight and make it into those rays that came through the trees. That would be what I would be trying to work with in landscapes using the light control in landscapes. Yeah. I love those rays of light that were shown in that sample. Yeah, that was pretty cool. Don't forget, guys, we, if you decide that you want to purchase Luminar 4, uh, we have a code. It's called it's WPS10, 
uh, and it gets you 10% off of the price or $10 off one or the other. I can't remember how it works, but you get 10, you get 10 something off on it. So you get some money off on the price. Okay. That's on the current Luminar 4. Yeah, that's on Luminar 4. Right now that code does not work for the Luminar AI because it's, it's still being introduced and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But the regular Luminar 4, that will work for. And also their, their version of HDR program uh, that will work for as well. Yeah. Jim, you look great in that photo, okay? So, well, submit thank it. thank you, Bob. I'm <laughs> glad you mentioned that. Well, you know, it's funny. I knew damn well Pat wouldn't let me use one of her photos. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a keeper. Yeah, oh yeah, definitely. All right, well, that's it on my end. Brian, do you have any closing information? Um, I don't believe I have anything to add. I appreciate you, uh, taking basically a whole meeting from me tonight. So I didn't have to do much of anything. So thank you. Jim. <laughs> You're welcome. Very nice presentation. I appreciate it. Uh, appreciate everyone's, uh, participation and Shirley, welcome. I hope we see you again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're, you're muted, Shirley. Thank you. Thank you so much for letting me participate a little. Yeah, we hope to see you back more often. Um, okay. And I hope that uh, you and Beth hook up on that class and in uh, the uh, black and white class. I think that'll be cool. So. Okay. Uh, other than that, I really don't have much. Uh, tomorrow's Thanksgiving, so everyone uh, enjoy the day and and however it is that you choose to uh, to do that. Uh, I hope you have a good day. Um, I'm going one of two things tomorrow. I'm either not leaving the house and I'm going to slay on a couch and watch TV all day, or I'm actually going to grab my camera and go do something. So mm -hmm. I haven't quite decided yet. It depends on how tomorrow morning goes. Uh, yeah, see how the rain goes. Uh, oh. Yeah, and the weather and whatnot. But um, I had a couple ideas of speaking. I wanted to go photograph, so I may may try to do that tomorrow if possible. Um, but anyhow, thanks for everyone that, have, that uh, um, participated. And I'm trying to think when is our what's our next meeting? Does anyone know offhand? Mm, no. Wednesday the first. Wednesday the second. Wednesday the second be our uh, Wednesday night actually, meeting. Actually, no, we uh, we will not have our our nighttime meeting that night. Um, okay. Our swig light meeting, that is going to be a, uh, the officers are going to use that night for a planning meeting for us to start planning out what we're going to do next year. Okay. Um, so, because uh, that was a, a swig light meeting. So we will see everyone on, it looks like the ninth is our next actual meeting. That'll be a swig light meeting on the ninth. And then the 14th, we have our regular WPS meeting. So um, I'm sure Margie will be, will be available. And at the next meeting, uh, she, she told me she wasn't feeling good. She called and said that she was sick. So, and I know she jumped on here for a few seconds and then she never came, she left and never came back. So, yeah. Um, Anyhow, if no one else has anything, that's all I have for tonight. I'll. Uh... Uh, I I had one question. Uh, I've been yeah. doing so many other things. I can't remember. I did send uh, a couple of images to you, Beth, and mm -hmm. I thought there was a, um, a project or a uh, an activity that we were going to do where we had a before and after, and that the group was going to work on the before images. And I provided an after image uh, for comparison. So I don't remember. Is that right? Where we was there was supposed to be something in the works like that? It's still in the works. That's one of the things that we'll probably be talking about at okay. the meeting because it's sure. we didn't we didn't have a definite like start end type thing for it yet. Okay, it was a maybe. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, Beth, is that your periodic table uh, blanket behind you? <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I didn't have one. Mendeleev's uh, chart. 
I probably got it at thinkgeek.com. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Think Geek is like, I could just say yes to like probably 90% of what they've got. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the chart has expanded a little. Yeah. Since yeah. Hey guys, um, the only other thing is, is you know, anybody that wants to volunteer to to take in a, take on a little section of the meeting or um, you know talk for a few minutes or point something out that they they've tried or you know always bring that stuff up and you're all we're we will do a hundred percent of our ability to get you know, involved in the meeting. So you know if you even if you've come across something and you want everyone to know about it, you know bring it to the meeting and tell us about it. So. Um, you know, that, that share part that Beth did, the, the first part there where she showed the dark room, that was pretty good. Uh, but that, that part on, on your side could also be, hey, I, I seen this video on YouTube and it's a three minute video that I thought was extremely worth seeing and let me share it, share it with you. It doesn't have to be a, a big thing or anything like that. So feel free to share anything at any point, you know. So the more participation we have, the, the better the meetings are for everyone. So, Absolutely. Um, Alan, one of these days, I'm going to get you to uh, maybe share a few of your photos. You seem to travel and take pictures, I think, like daily. I see different posts from, from like all over the place. So we're going to have to get you involved and get you uh, sharing some of your photos one of these days. I don't know how the share screen works. That's all right. We'll teach you how. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy. <laughs> it's easy. Uh, but I don't know if you guys don't follow Alan on uh, Facebook. Uh, you should if you're on Facebook. He's he's somewhere. I think like every 14 minutes he's at a different place. So <laughs> uh, anyhow, uh, that's pretty much all I got. Um, if you guys don't have anything else, I guess yeah, we can. Happy Thanksgiving, all. Yes. Happy Thanksgiving, happy Thanksgiving everybody. Happy Take Thanksgiving. care. Yep. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Brian. Yep. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Thanks, Matt. Thank Thanks, you, everybody. Jim. Good night. 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 Happy Good night. Good night. Good night. Happy Thanksgiving. Yes.